Okay, so we've spent a lot of time examining the motion of objects. How fast do they travel? How far do they travel? What time do they travel? What's their acceleration? But what we now need to look at is the causes of the motion of an object. What causes an object to move? Because then that in turn is going to predict for us how high, how far, and how fast. So this is going to be kind of a very conceptual type of lecture here today. And there's going to be some new vocabulary terms I'm going to throw at you. You should take notes. And I will have kind of a brief summary at the end of this presentation to make sure that you hit all the high points in your notes. For now, sit back and listen and just kind of soak these concepts up because you have to understand the concepts before we get to the point of doing any mathematical explanations. So let's consider the motion of a ball. And we've done a lot with this. We've been able to figure out, well, how far will it go that way? How fast is it moving if it goes a certain distance in a certain time? If we launch this thing at an angle, we know how fast it's moving this way and how fast it's moving that way. And we can use that to determine how long it's going to be in motion, how high will it go, and how far forward it will go. What we need to start doing now is try to explain the why. Why does it move that way? And that leads us into our next big unit of study, which is about forces. And I'm not talking about the Star Wars kind of the force. We're talking about physics force. Although at the end of the unit, we can draw some obvious parallels between the two and see why that term was used in a science fiction movie like Star Wars. So in its simplest, the definition of what a force is, is a push or a pull. And you need to push or pull something to affect some motion. If I think about this ball, if I want to get it to move that way, I got to push it that way. When you throw a ball, that's literally what you're doing. You are pushing it. And how I push determines the motion of the ball. If I push it straight up, we know that's going to be a different motion than if I push it horizontally or at an angle. You also realize that the harder you push, you're going to change the motion of the object more. If I push harder, it's going to go further or it's going to go higher. So a force is a push or a pull, and it is what determines, it's the cause of the motion and the change in motion of an object. Now, before we move on, we need to clarify that a force is in fact a vector. Because think about pushing or pulling something. I've got this ball, and if I say I exert a force on it, if I push on it or pull on it a certain way, that has to be directional. Because if I said push on this ball, push it somewhere, it doesn't matter how you do it, whether you push it that way, this way, this way, or this way, there is a directional component to a force because you can't push or pull without doing that in a direction. So in a sense, a force is the easiest type of vector to visualize conceptually. You can't have a force and not be a vector because to push and pull, you have to push and pull a certain direction. So got a definition of a force. It is a push or a pull. Forces are vectors. In other words, they have a certain direction associated with them. Okay. So I want to re-examine our object here. And this is like our spring-loaded spring -loaded toy car, our guy right here. We loaded the toy car and we put it on the tabletop and it just sat there until we did something. We could leave that toy car loaded like this on the tabletop for all of eternity and it's not going to move. It wasn't going to have any motion off the tabletop until we pressed the trigger and it launched it. The spring provided a push and it pushed the car off the tabletop. But if we didn't release the spring, this car would sit on that tabletop for an eternity. And there's a name for that. This is called inertia. And a really smart guy named Isaac Newton came up with this whole concept about forces. We think about Newton 
and gravity. You know, he's sitting in the apple tree and the apple falls down, hits him on the head, and he gets the idea of gravity. And there's a little bit of truth of that. And we'll examine that when we get to gravity, which is in fact a force. But Newton had this idea about how things move and what causes them to move and this idea of forces. And through his careful observations and mathematical calculations, he came up with some laws that dictate the motion of objects. And his first law is called, quite creatively, Newton's first law. But it's also called the law of inertia. So we need to define what inertia is. Inertia is the tendency of a body to resist a change in its motion. That's what inertia is. And if we think about this in terms of my toy car and I set it on the tabletop, it was going to sit there for all of eternity until something came along and made it move. That's what inertia is. Think about it this way, an object at rest will remain at rest and an object in motion will remain in motion until a net force acts upon it. That's what fancy, but if you think about this, it makes sense. This car will sit on the tabletop forever and ever until there's a force that makes it move. And we've got a force being provided in this toy spring. So if we release it, if we let the spring go, it will impact a force on the car and that will cause its motion to change. The car doesn't really want to change. It will sit there for all of eternity. That's inertia. But if we give a force, if we give it a push or a pull, it will then change its motion. So inertia is the tendency of an object to resist a change in its motion because Things do resist a change in its motion unless there is a force acting upon it. Now, let's go back to our projectile motion problems. Here we've got our horizontally launched projectile, and we know that it has an initial velocity in the y dimension of zero because it's going horizontal. We have an x velocity, and I drew it with that little arrow right there. So we don't need a number, but we say, okay, it's x velocity is basically that big. As soon as the toy car goes off the tabletop or the projectile goes off the cliff or the ball goes off the top of the building, does its motion change? Well, let's think about X and Y here. VY there was zero. A few seconds later or a split second later, it's got some downward Y velocity. Now, notice I, I drew an arrow kind of, kind of small, small Y velocity. Once we get over to here, it's got a little bit more Y velocity. Once we get over here, it's got even more Y velocity. Something is changing the motion of that car. Ergo, there must be a force. There must be something pushing or pulling that is making the motion of the object, in this case, the toy car, change. And we know what that force is. We know that force is gravity. The gravity is pulling down on the toy car. And that changes the motion of the object as it falls through the air. But look at the X velocity. And we know this about the X velocity. X velocity was that big there. It's that big there. It's that big there. The X velocity doesn't change. That's inertia. Inertia is basically an object in motion will stay in motion, object at rest will stay at rest until something, until net force acts upon it. So basically, inertia states that the motion of the object will stay the same until there's some force that acts on it. In the X direction, there is no force acting on the object as it goes that way. There is a force in the Y dimension, that's gravity. But going this way, there is no force that acts to speed the car up or slow the car down in that direction. That's what inertia is. It is the motion is going to stay the same until something comes along and changes it for us. Now, if halfway through the flight of the toy car, I turned on a really big fan over here and I blew a bunch of wind at the toy car. Well, now I got another force and that force would change the motion of the car in the X direction. It would, it would get it smaller. But inertia states that Newton's first law, the law of inertia says, a motion is going to stay the same until a net force acts on it. And with our toy car, there was no force acting in the X, 
So it stayed moving the same way. In the Y, that is not the case. In the Y, there is a net force. It's gravity. There's a lot of gravitational force that is pulling the car down. So the motion changes this way. Now, theoretical question. We take this toy car, set it on a table, deep in outer space, away from the surface of the Earth. Because we know the Earth is the thing that's causing the gravity. If I launch this car from a table in outer space, it would go in a straight line, theoretically, forever. Because we said there has to be some kind of force that's going to change the motion of an object. Well, on Earth, we see that you know, gravity is changing the motion in the Y. We go in deep in outer space where basically there is no gravity. If I launch the toy car, it'll keep going straight and straight and straight until there is some other force that causes its motion to change. Now, if I pointed this toy car towards Jupiter and it got close enough to Jupiter, well, then Jupiter's gravity could pull on the toy car and change its motion. But remember that inertia is the tendency of an object to resist a change in, a mo in its motion. It's going to keep the same motion unless something forces it to change. Toy car remains at rest forever and ever and ever until something causes the toy car to change being at rest. That is a force. That's what a force does. It pushes or pulls and then it changes the motion of an object. Now, so let's talk about some examples of forces. And the, the first and most obvious one we want to talk about is that whole gravity thing. And we'll do a whole unit on specifically on that gravitational force. But let's talk about the simplest aspect of gravitational force. Consider this little metal weight here. If I hold it in my hand, I feel it pushing down or I feel gravity pulling it down in my hand. That's a force. I can feel the push or pull of gravity here. I can conceptualize it. I get it. It's pulling down on my hand. Take the styrofoam ball. Now, in this case, I don't necessarily really feel it. But is gravity acting on this styrofoam ball just like it was on this metal block? The answer is yes. But I don't feel it as much here. Other hand take a brick and I certainly feel it there. So I'm feeling three different forces. I'm feeling three different pulls because I've got three different objects. But remember, we said before that gravity is determined by the mass of the earth and the mass of the earth is always the same. So when we were doing our free fall problems, we said, oh, gravity is always the same, changes the motion the same way. And that is true. But the force, the push or pull that gravity causes on an individual object varies. And you know that because I can feel a difference in the gravitational force, the push, the pull between these objects. Well, what's the difference between these objects? They're both on the Earth, and it is still the mass of the Earth that is causing that pull. But it's different on these two different objects because one has a lot more mass than the other. And that's the trick with the gravitational force. The mass now matters. So that the more massive an object, the more stuff there is, the more of a pull, or the stronger the force is from gravity. Not as much mass, you don't have nearly as much pull or force from gravity. So we call that force that we feel from gravity, we call it the weight. And you know what weight is. You step onto a bathroom scale and gravity pulls you onto the bathroom scale and you read a number. Your weight is basically the force of gravity pulling down on you. If you go to the moon and you step on the scale, you will have less weight because the moon doesn't pull your mass down as hard as the earth does. A bigger person gets pulled more than a lighter person because the weight the magnitude of the force, the weight, is dependent upon the mass of the object. So weight is a force, and you know that it's a force because it is certainly directional. You can't take a bathroom scale and hold it over your head and measure your weight. It has to be underneath your feet where gravity pulls you down on top of the scale. So weight 
is a force and weight is the force of gravity acting on the mass of an object. And how do we measure that? We're not going to use bathroom scales because they're, they're, they're not scientific instruments. They don't measure in uh, SI units. We're going to use something like this. This is called a spring scale. And this measures the force, in this case, caused by gravity. You'll notice on there, it's zeroed out. And when I put a little hanger on there, now the needle turns and I, and I see there's a certain amount of force. Gravity is pulling down on this object and the spring scale measures it. Well, this is a mass hanger. And if I put more mass on there, watch what happens to the resulting force. It goes up. Same planet, but now we've got more of a force because we've got more mass hanging down here. Same would be true. I do the brick. A lot more mass means a lot more weight or a stronger pull from gravity, a greater force. Weight is a force. Okay. You might have noticed on this, this has a unit here on it. The Newton is the unit of force. That's how we measure the pushes and pulls caused by gravity. Now, how do we, how do we get a unit of a Newton? How do we get weight? Big W in physics is weight, and it's that gravitational force on an object's mass. Mass makes a difference. The bigger the mass, the more the weight. Well, now think about what is causing the force. It is the Earth, and there is an acceleration caused by the, gravita the gravity of the Earth, and that is 9.81 meters per second squared that we typically call G. This is the formula to calculate the force of something's weight. The bigger the mass, the bigger the weight's gonna be. The bigger the value for gravity, the larger the weight or the force will be. Well, this here on the earth is always 9.81 meters per second squared. But if we went to the moon, this number would be smaller. Your mass stays the same, but the force, that weight is going to be lower on the moon because it has a lower acceleration due to gravity. If we go to Jupiter, and this number is a lot bigger on Jupiter, well, then your weight is going to be higher. Your mass is the same. If I take you in deep outer space, get you really far away from any planet, get you impossibly far away from any planet where there is actually no acceleration due to gravity from any other planet, and this would be zero, notice what your weight is. It's zero. No matter what that is, you have zero weight. You hear this being referred to as being weightless, and that can be the case. You can actually have zero weight. Now, you still have mass, but you actually have zero weight if you get far enough away from the Earth in deep space, no acceleration due to gravity. All right, now, when we do the math, and that's coming, the units here, this is meters per second squared. We're going to measure mass in kilograms. A kilogram times meters per second squared is the unit of a newton. And the newton is the SI unit of force. It, that is the unit that we measure or that we use to measure how much you're pushing or pulling. In this case, we're talking about the push or pull of something's weight. But when we get to that spring in the toy car, we're going to measure the force, calculate the force. How much did that spring push the toy car? That's also measured in newtons. Any unit of force in a science class is going to be measured in newtons. So let's talk about the forces acting on this ball right now. Okay. Is there a gravitational force? Is there a weight of this ball? Answer is yes. It has mass and gravity is pulling it that way. There is a weight on this ball. Now the ball is not moving right now. It is zero motion. But there is a force pulling it down but it's not moving down. 
And the answer is why? Well, that's because I am also exerting a force this way. If I stop exerting my force up, the ball drops, then the motion changes. So it's not just the fact that you have a force that makes the motion of something. It's do you have what's called a net force? Is one force bigger than the other? And that's what's going to cause the motion to change. This right here is a state that we call equilibrium. In other words, there are equal forces. I'm pulling up with a force that is greater than the weight pulling down. And so long as these forces remain balanced or in equilibrium, the motion is going to stay the same. What's the motion right now? Motion is zero. So, so long as the forces remain balanced or in equilibrium, motion does not change. If I don't pull as hard, and actually in this case here, I'm, I'm, I'm really moving my arm, but imagine this was so super heavy that I couldn't hold it up and I'm slowly losing the battle. I'm going to drop it. The weight is greater than the force I'm able to hold it with. It's going to move that way. So one force has to be greater than the other in order for the motion to change. You can have motion and all kinds or forces in all kinds of directions, but one has to be bigger than the other in order for the motion to change. For example, I push on the board. I'm exerting a really big force on this board right now, but it's not moving anywhere because I can't push with strong enough force to get the board to move that way. Now, right now the board is in place. If I do this, if I exert a very little bit of a force, it moves that direction. Now, the little wheels and the tracks, there's some friction in there that keeps the board right there. But if I push with just enough force, I can get it to move. I now exert a greater force than the springs, the wheels on the side, and it moves in that direction. Same as the other way around. Right now, it's in equilibrium. It's not moving. Gravity is pulling the board down, but there are, like I said, the springs in the side equal the force going down. Nothing changes. It remains in equilibrium because all the forces are balanced. But if I add a little bit of force, now the forces going down are greater than the forces in the springs, and its motion changes. So this is the concept of for net forces and equilibrium. So let's take a look at this situation here. Here I've got a brick and it has weight and you know, gravity is, is causing the weight, causing the force. And I can feel it. This brick is really pulling down. Well, I am holding it up. I am providing enough force with my hand that counteracts the weight of the brick. And right now it's motion is not changing. It will stay like this so long as I provide enough force going up. Now I want to point out something about this. I'm not even pulling on the brick at all, am I? I'm not even touching this brick, yet I am still exerting a force on it. I'm able to pull up on the brick. This is a special type of force that we call tension. You might have heard of that word before. You kind of sort of know what it means, but now we're going to quantify it in a physics sense. <coughs> Tension is a force that is exerted through a rope or a chain or a string. It's not a, exactly a force directly on an object, but it's a way you can exert a force through a rope. The tension in this rope is directly related to the force or the weight on this object. Right now, let's say this thing has a weight of 10 newtons. I'm making up a number. That's the force of the brick's weight. What's my force pulling up? 10 newtons. Because the forces must be equal and balanced because this object is in equilibrium. It is not moving. The tension in this string would have to be five newtons. Well, why five and not 10? Because there's two strings. These two strings are 
sharing the workload of supporting the brick. Well, if the weight of the brick is 10, the tensional force in these two strings must be five each. Now, had I tied this brick up and was holding it with one string, the tension in that one string would then be 10. This is one of the reasons why when you have a really heavy object, you'll see it supported by a lot of strings. Think of like a big bridge with all those cables. It weighs a lot. There's a lot of force pulling it down. So you have to have a lot of strings to share that force. Otherwise, the tension would be too great and the string would break and the object would fall. On that note, let's get to here. And I've got my tension. I'm holding it up and I'm going to release the tension. And we saw the motion of the brick change because now once I release this force, there's no force going up. There's still a force going down. Well, you can see it. It's being pushed or pulled more one way than another. It moved that direction. On the other hand, hold it like this. If I pull more, its motion changes in the direction of whichever force is bigger. So this is why we're going to have that concept of adding vectors and seeing, well, which one is the bigger vector? Because that's going to determine which way my object moves. Now, okay, I'm tired of holding this brick. I'm going to let it sit right there. Now you'll notice it's not moving. Let's examine the forces on this brick. Is there still weight? Sure, it's, it still has mass and it's still on the earth. There's still weight of this brick. But the motion's not changing. So that means that there, there must be an equal and opposite force pushing the other way. Well, what's pushing the other direction is this table. This table is exerting a force upward on the brick. That's why it will stay motionless. Now, the table, it's not the weight of the table that, that's exerting the force. Remember, weight always goes down, even though this table does have weight. That's not the force that is supporting against this brick's weight because it's pushing up. We call this the normal force. And I'll explain to you why in just a second on the board. But the normal force is a force that is provided perpendicular to the ground by an object. Think of the floor. When you walk across the floor, you don't accelerate. You don't sink into the floor because the floor pushes back against you. That's what this table is doing. It's providing a force going up against the brick's weight going down. And they must be equal and opposite because the brick's motion is not changing. Now, right now, let's say the, the weight of this brick is 10 Newtons. The table must be pushing back with a weight of 10 Newtons. The normal force can be different. The normal force can actually change, even though it's the same table. An example of that, if I hop up on the table, I certainly have more mass than that brick. And yet this table is able to push back against my weight with whatever my weight force is. So the normal force varies. It has a maximum value though. What do you think what would happen if I set an elephant up here on this table? Well, the elephant would go crashing through. There is a limit to what normal force can be provided by a surface. But the normal force is a vertical or a perpendicular force to the surface of contact, the floor, the, uh, the ground. So as we go into start solving these force problems, just like we did with, with the motion problems, it's always very helpful to draw a picture. And when we draw a picture, we want to represent the forces as arrows because they are vectors. And it's going to help us conceptualize and, and kind of get a picture of which one's bigger or smaller than the other. And therefore, how will the motion of this object be determined? We do this with what's called a free body diagram. A free body diagram is just a picture that represents all of the forces acting on an object. And for now, we'll start off pretty simple with only a couple, but there can get to be multiple forces in 
very different directions. Think about my brick here. Here is my brick. Generally, we draw the force from the center of mass. And I would label that as W for my weight. Okay. Now, if it's sitting on a tabletop, like I've shown here in the picture, I must have another force that is pushing against it. And that is from the table itself. We call that the normal force. F of N, F for force, N, normal. We're going to have a lot of different forces. They're all Fs, and we're going to have to label them what they are. Well, this is the normal force. There was a, I drew that vector about the same size as this one because it's not moving. It's just sitting there on the countertop. Same would be true. Let's say I had my brick, and I was holding it by a string like I was. I'm going to call that a, a tensional force. In this case, I still have weight. But in this case, the force acting against the object's weight is a tensional force, not a normal force from a surface, a horizontal surface like a floor or a table. If I'm holding the brick like this, there could be another force acting on it. Here's my brick. That's that diagram right there. What if I push on it that way? Then the motion changes. It starts moving that way. Well, then it comes back. But you get the idea that I can have a force where I push on it this way. I can have a force where it pushes on it this way. I can have more than one force pulling up. In this case, with our brick, I would actually have two green arrows because there are two strings. The more correct free body diagram would be something like this. Whereas these two tensional forces together are about the same size as the weight force going down. Okay. So a free body diagram is just a way for us to sketch what forces are acting on an object. I might even label something like that. When I pushed on it that way, that was the force that I provided. That's the Wiegand force. If I had somebody else pushing this way, The force of somebody else could be pushing this way. If this force were bigger than my force, well, then it's going to move this direction. If my force is bigger than the other person's force, then it's going to move that way. This is something that you have to do with these force problems. So here we go. Here's a summary of that 30 minute presentation. This is what you should know about forces at this point, whether you have it written in your notebook or you just have it up here in your head. I'm telling you, this is what you're going to be held accountable for. So at this point, you can kind of go back and summarize. You can check with your friends and your neighbors. You can go to Google and you could do a Google search, but I, I can almost promise you that the stuff you're going to find on Google is not going to be as clear and as simply explained as what was presented in this video. I'm writing the test. I'm going to put the definitions of these things and the ideas of these things in the words that I use to explain them to you. So if you go to Google, it might not sound so uh, clear or as related to my definition. So just be careful. If you have any questions about these, please feel free to put them in the chat. You can verbalize them through the meeting or in person. You can ask. Tomorrow, we will start working on problems where we apply this stuff mathematically.